Kate, is it on? All right. Uh, Kate will also be facilitating tonight's conversation with Nico. Uh, as we were researching, we found a note that said Nico would really prefer you li simply listen to his music instead of re just reading his bio. Uh, this being academ academia, I'll do it anyway, uh, but I'll be brief. Uh, Nico Jar is a highly regarded multimedia artist who began making organic electronic music in 2004. Since then, he has released several albums and performs internationally. He is the owner and founder of Clown and Sunset, his own record label and art house. Uh, a couple of his colleagues may or may not join him later. <laughs> uh, Nico's work seems like a perfect match with the speaker series, which allows Atlas to bring in technologists, artists, and innovative thinkers as a way to look at the ways that technology is both shaping both art and society. The Atlas speaker series is made possible by a generous donation by Edith Harrell Caperton and Annette Harrell. As a last note, Nico has another community key performance tomorrow, and I hope you get the chance to see him perform from scratch uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. at E-Town Hall. Uh, please help me give a warm welcome to Nico Jar. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry? Is my mic on? Is my mic on? Is your mic on? I don't have a mic. I might not need a mic because I can. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. I bet you can. Sorry. Or you might need a mic. <laughs> I'll use this one. All right. So, which one do I push? <laughs> All right. Hello. Thanks. All right. You have to go very close to it. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> so you just played a couple songs for us. Yes. But I don't really want to talk about Pimp Juice, <laughs> which I had played before that other, a little more serious. Well, why did you just play Pimp Juice for I guess. Us? I, I, I just graduated a year ago from, from Brown, and I, I guess one of my dreams is to just play pimp juice in, the, in like a funny, you know, in like a, in like a, like a school thing <laughs> like this. That's, all, that's as simple as it was. You're not, not highly influenced by Nelly or... I, I'm sh yeah, I think I am highly influenced by a lot of hip-hop that came out um, in the early 2000s, but it was just... I was like, oh, look at this. This reminds me of being in school. Perfect I wish, I wish you know, people could just go inside a lecture hall and, and hear Nelly. That, that, that's really all it was. <laughs> and then uh, after that, you played another song for us. Uh, very brief, something that, um, that me and a friend made yesterday. And I was just like, oh, I, let's hear what this sounds like. Seems like you are able to, like, you're probably constantly making music. I try to. You try to. Yes. So do you go through phases of performing and then um, going into the studio? It depends how, how uh, lonely I am. If, I'm, if, if, if my girlfriend's not there and, and I don't have too many friends at that moment in time, then I'm making a lot of music. If I'm hanging out and like, I have my girlfriend in town, then it's more difficult. But you're known to be um, a highly collaborative artist as well. So More and more so. I've mm -hmm. tried to... I've tried to I guess communicate, you know, mm -hmm. with like within in the actual creation of the of the music to have that that interesting communication. So not only to have communication with the audience, but to also have communication with, between human beings when you're actually making something. But it, it's to me, it seems like it's a it's a new thing, at least the past year or so, two years. What um, what instigated you to create from scratch? Is it something related to this process in a way? From scratch is really is a funny. It's funny how it came about. Um, MoMA PS1 wanted us to collaborate in in New York. They wanted us to collaborate in something, and we had a very elaborate kind of ridiculous plan. And we sat down and we were gonna and I was gonna say this is the ridiculous plan we want to do. And then I realized that I was talking to like 20 people, and I realized that our plan was very stupid. It was just like a you know, it was a very stupid plan. And so then I said, I need to go to the bathroom. And I, because I didn't feel like I, wa I, I didn't feel like I was going into this like hardcore meeting with all these people. I thought it was just like a thing. I don't know. And so then I go to the bathroom, like, okay, what the hell is going to be the new proposal? And then I just made it up. <laughs> but it ended up being great. And so now we're going to do it as much as possible. <laughs> I was like, what, you know, wouldn't it be great to, um, you know, create everything there with people. You know, the audience is there. We can record them if we want to. We can record the people. 
the, collab the different collaborators that come in and out. Um, people can be focusing on the dancers if that's what they want to do. They can, um, you know, look at the videos. They can listen to music. And it's not about it being like play the song or or do this thing. It's more about you know for five hours these people have no idea what the hell they're doing. So what's funny is that I ended up improvising the idea, and it, you know right. it's kind of the same. Right. And but you'll use a lot of the same tools and instruments that you would use to create your own music right. anyway. Of exactly. course. Exactly. And that's what's exciting. It, I mean, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it if it wasn't. Right. You know using the same exact kind of setups that I, that I use when I'm actually in the studio or, or well, in my house, making, making the actual songs. Yeah. So that's why I'm comfortable enough to like be there for five hours and be like, you know, and, and like, I mean, find something to, to show. Yeah. Right. Um, and I remember uh, with the original from scratch that happened at PS1, that you had all these records that you had gotten in Brazil and that you were dropping these records in the show that you hadn't even heard before. Yeah. And this is, so this is something that's interesting to me because you, your musical influences kind of speak to a similar, like, eclecticism. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I just had them good, in my bag, so why not? Example. This is what I'm going to use. Right. This morning I was late, Will knows this, for, for our taxi pickup, and, and I just grabbed these records. So I don't know what they are. I mean, not really. It just, you know... I mean, Sun Ra, this is nice. This, is, this I picked. I picked also the Yusuf Latif one, but I, the Pisco Sour, <laughs> I really don't know what Pisco Sour is. You know, and <laughs> la, la Chica de los Ojos Brujos, that's nice. It sounds very nice, but I don't know what it is either. And um, Nuestro Show, that's nice. I mean, these are all, actually, most of these are things I got in Chile. I was in Chile uh, six months ago. I'm, I'm from there originally, and I bought all these things. This is a Hammond and Percussion. Sounds very nice to me. Um, what is that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, got a, I brought a couple of Los Angeles Negros because I really like them, and, and, you know, they're easy to sample, so you can steal them. <laughs> um, you probably all know the, probably don't have it there, the, this Jay-Z song called uh, my first song, maybe. Do any of you know that? You know, well, anyways, it's a very nice song. And they, Kanye sampled Los Angeles Negros. Maybe it wasn't Kanye, but I think it was Kanye. So, yeah, you know, this is, I, I don't really know what, you know, usually in the studio I just pick some record out that I bought that I maybe know what it is, maybe don't know, maybe found it funny, like the Pisco Sour record, and really try my hardest to make a song with it. Like, that's, it, it, gets, it, it gets me, I don't know, it gets me to, to try new things, I guess. Yeah, so this kind of eclecticism reminds me of some of your, like the stories that I know of your earliest influences and how you found, um, the, the, found your way into making the music that you make now, which connects back to, if I... You should maybe tell a story, but what's the story? The story of the f the first three influences that of the records that your father found for you, which oh, interesting. Which so I remember. So there was Ricardo. There was um, Eric Satie. Eric Satie. There was some yeah. Mulato Astatke. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, hmm. Interesting. So that's a spectrum of music. Ricardo Villalobos, minimalist right. electronic producer. Right. Who's highly influential in dance music. Right. Mulatu Stake, who's been making music for maybe 40 years right. at this point and is still an innovator. Um, and uh, Eric Satie. So, um, Very strange man. Yeah. And, and all of these three different types. It seems, for me, knowing your history as a composer and as a musician, I, I can see these three influences mm -hmm. in your work. Um, but what was it like being, bef as, you, as you were discovering the music that you wanted to make and right. finding these other influences? And I'm, I'm going in this direction because, because you mentioned that you want to play other people's music for the people in this room. Yes, right. Um, I guess when I think about those three influences, I think about the first batch of music that I made. And um, I guess the music that I'm making now is, I guess, influenced by maybe some other things. Mm -hmm. But that person, 
that was influenced by Muleta, Stad, Gehrig, Satie, and, and Ricardo Villalobos, um, I guess was, I, I was trying to, I was trying to put together these different, these really different sounds that really didn't fit. And that, um, and, and I, I hope you can imagine how bad it, it sounds if you put all those three songs, this, like, you know, those three artists together. And I guess that's what excited me, right? Just that, oh, you know, putting Eric Satie with Mulata Statke with Ricardo just would sound really terrible and it would probably end up being this, like, um, kind of, like, electro-jazz, um, pseudo, you know, classic music. I don't know, just bad, right? Sure. Um, and I think at my worst, that's what, my, that, what the music that I used to make um, sounds like. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, and, but I, but I guess it's hard for me to talk about those three influences because coming out of school, especially this past year since I graduated from Brown, I've gone through like a lot of, you know, I've, I've gotten to love a lot of different other, other types of music that in a way make me I guess before, that's all I had. That, right. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, it's, all I had was like, I really like this guy, I really like that guy, I really like that. And I'm going to try to put it together. Right? And now I feel like I've kind of found the influences that I, that I truly believe in. Mm. Not that I don't believe in these three. Sure, no, I, I think but, I understand. Sorry, it's a little confusing. Well, uh, yeah. Can you tell us what you're listening to now and what's, what you find highly influential now? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can play something. Well, here's someone who I find really influential in general. Um, well, you know what? I'm going to play this. This is not necessarily something that I listen to every day, but I had a moment like five months ago where, or like, no, less, not too long ago, where I realized that this was probably like my favorite song ever. And it kind of encapsulates what I'm trying to do now, which is, um, to me, this song is probably one of the most psychedelic things I've ever heard. It's very psychedelic. Um, and yet, it's not, none of the sounds are psychedelic. And I feel like the music that I made in the first three, four years of, you know, the stuff that I put out was trying to be psychedelic with the textures and with the, the way it sounds. I guess I'm not, I think that's, that's fine, but now I'm interested in other things making it just psychedelic, right? Um, and that's a much harder mm -hmm. thing, right? So let me just play you this song. Maybe you'll understand how it's psychedelic. Maybe you'll think I'm crazy for thinking it's psychedelic. But I, it's a great song anyway, so. Can you all still hear me? Yeah, it's fine? Cool. Thank you. 
I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but that's at least as psychedelic as your airport. <laughs> I mean, um, I just heard about all the reptilians that live underneath it, and I've been thinking about that. But what I like about this song is, is that, well, first of all, it's like, there's the duet thing, which is its own thing, but they, you know, the, what's her name? So, yeah, Nancy, it's Nancy Sinatra and Lee mm -hmm. Hazelwood, and it's called Some Velvet Morning. So Nancy Sinatra has her whole, like, world where she's in, and it's, it's just like, it arrives when it arrives. Not, not in the, at the, the time that you expect it to, especially at the end, there's this is incredible back and forth. So they're taking this idea of duet and, like, in a way, playing with time in like a, I mean, in a way that's, that's, that's very exciting, at least to hear from an electronic music perspective. Because I've tried doing things like this, and it's so hard. So there's something to be said about how psychedelic it is to not have a straight line and to have constantly a, a kind of rethinking of where we are in terms of where the time is. You, you kind of get this when you listen to Jay, um, Jay Dilla, right? And like he doesn't put the, doesn't put the kick and, and it drops on the snare. So you're just like, where, where did the thing go? And then it's there. <laughs> Those of you who've heard Jay Dilla know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and Jay Paul does that too. Jay Dilla, Jay Paul. Well, a lot of people do that, right? Anyways, but that thing. Um, but that's like the a pretty like a more obvious way of doing it, right? It's just like oh, let's keep it in four four, but let's get rid of this downbeat that we're so used to in hip hop and, and in dance music. But this is something different, and Animal Collective does that really well. Um, but the idea of changing signatures inside of electronic music, and it still have such a catchy song and such a melody that you can just sing along to, and that you can literally continue bobbing your head to, to me is like amazing and super psychedelic and and that's kind of what's influencing me now these ideas of having still a very accessible song but um, playing with time in that way that's that's one thing that I'm thinking about when was that song released do you remember I think you're pausing again do you remember am I on? well can you all hear her yeah. yes yeah but it won't be no? recorded otherwise oh let's see it has to be green well, this, this seems to be like there's a problem here with the battery. Uh, do, you, yeah. do you remember? Oh, no, there, you one, two. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, let's see that. Maybe it works. Probably. There yeah. we go. Good times. So when, I think it was like 68. Right. So that's, Maybe not 68, but I think 60s. So that's that's uh, good. Yeah, it's good for that time. Yeah, it's amazing to yeah, see amazing. that type of. I mean, it's a very it's a very different type of composition. Totally. And I think I got to know personally that song from a podcast that a friend of yours released that I've listened to a lot. Who's I that? can't remember um, exactly what it came out, but it's right. it was one of the early Clown and Sunset. Right. Uh, mixes. Sounds like something Nikita would do. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, Tell us about Clown and Sunset and what you're doing with you. You're not. You haven't just made a label. You've made uh, an art house, as you call it. To a certain extent, um, it's. You know, there are things that are put on paper and text that are difficult for me to to live up to because it's it's really just. I started when I was 19, and I just wanted to put out my friend's music, and it's been that to this day. Um, and so inherently it's something very small and very intimate. Um, Val, who's playing, Valentin Steep, Val, who's playing here on Sunday and maybe will join us tomorrow for From Scratch, um, is someone I've known for, for at least 10 years, I think. He went to my high school, was my, my first girlfriend's brother. I mean, it's very intimate. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's, that's all it really is. I, I guess that's, that's as much as I can say about it. I, I don't necessarily want it to be anything bigger than that. 
I find that really encouraging for maybe some of the other people in this room who make music because um, most people are told these days that they have to play a certain game when, when it comes to making music and performing music. And um, you're really defining, you're, you're kind of writing your own rules right now um, in your composition, in the way that you're choosing to work in the world. Um, and I think that's inspirational for a lot of other people. Um, the fact that you're inspired by Lee Hazelwood or, and Nancy Sinatra yeah. and, and these types of compositions um, is reflected, I think, also in the label. Um, I mean, you know, something funny is I remember in, like, it was, like, 2009, probably, and I would hear all these podcasts and Resident Advisor because, like, I was 19, and that's w what I thought a podcast was, right? Um, and I would hear some other podcasts, I guess. But in the dance music world, it seemed like it was all about, like, these club sets that you can hear in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. And for me, that, for some reason, seems strange. Now, today, I'm glad to have a... I, I, I guess now I understand it. It's like, if you're in that type of mood, and you're, like, maybe driving really fast somewhere, maybe you want to listen to, like, you know, 130 BPM Bergheim techno. But I guess at the time, I didn't want to listen to that. Right. Not at home. And I felt like podcasts were, like, a home thing. Mm -hmm. And in a way, to this day, I feel that. Um, and, and the Clown and Sunset thing was more like... I wanted like some form of brand that just had everything to, in the same place, right? Just like a basket. It's like, let's put this here, right? Um, and the SoundCloud was cool be because it was like, let's put a podcast here or let's put the new song here. And it was like, I was excited by SoundCloud then because it was kind of new. And it was like, look, you can see the waveform. You know, it was like, it's, it's part of all that for me, really. You sent me my original invite to SoundCloud. Look at that. Yeah, no, I, I don't know, I don't know who sent me the SoundCloud stuff, but I really was, like, on it. Like, you were really on it. I was really on it. SoundCloud should, should really thank you for no, that. No, no, no. But, but, yeah, I wish I... Yeah, I wish, yeah. That's but you like these methods of sharing other, not just one type yeah, of right. way of listening to music. I like telling a story, like, oh, this week we're going to give you a podcast, and guess what? There's not one kick drum, haha. <laughs> and then, like, next, and, like, next week it's going to be, like... This, like, dance track by Sol Keita. Ha ha. <laughs> you know, like, that was cool for me, you know, when, when I was, like, younger. Right. Um, obviously, it has to be sustainable, and that's hard, you know. You have to go on tour. But that's fine. But, as I said before, it's, it's, it's supposed to be intimate. And, and no matter what Clown and Sunset turns into in the future... Mm -hmm whether it stays as Clown Sunset or something else, it's always going to be, that's going to be the idea. It's going to be things we love and we want to share, and I hope that it's where it stays, because I personally think when you go into the realm of let's try to you know, build a brand and an identity and, and something that can be sold, and, and let's collaborate with all these you know, fancy brands that are going to give you a bunch of money, because that's a real, real thing today, like the whole marketing of culture and... Um, in, bi in business or whatever is like such a real thing. Everyone wants to be cool and try to get in with like that. And it's, you know, that's not where I want the label to go. And, and that's never, gonna, I hope that's never going to happen, you know, because it's really easy to get sucked into that because it's, it would, it would make it, it would make a lab, having a label profitable. But that's not the point. The point is just sharing, hopefully, you know. Um, I bet there's a lot of people here that don't know about the prism. Yeah. Um, maybe you could tell us what, what the prism is. and. Yeah. So, you know, the, I, I mean, we're talking about a lot of stuff that I guess I have some distance from right now. And it's funny for me to talk about them because it's like I see myself as a young person in a way. Not that I'm, I'm still obviously very young, but I see kind of all the mistakes that I, that I made when I, like, thought it was a good idea to release music on a cube, you know? <laughs> I mean, okay. right? Um, and so, so the, the initial idea was like, oh, you know, I don't really like CDs, you know, because 
I just, I mean, I knew that these computers are, were going to come out with no CDs, and, and like everyone like loves vinyl, but like, you know, where are CDs going to go in like 10 years? Probably nowhere, you know? Probably like, they're, the, it's going to be the, a serious decline, right? That's what, that's what it's been until now. Um, but I thought I would, I wanted to like say something about that, and I wanted to release music in a way that was different. Um, so, um, what we did is we made a tiny, tiny silver cube with two headphone jacks, and the music was um, inside of it. And so you basically could listen to it with another person, and so the idea was that it was an inherently a shareable object, that if you were listening to it alone, it was, um, it was the, the fact that it was a lonely experience was staring at your face. And I liked that. Right? That was like the point. I mean, and, 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 and I promise you, in, in my naive moment, I thought that, that that's what would get across. But of course, that's not what gets across. We're in like a hyper-capitalist, you know, you know, level, I guess. And once you sell something, it never comes out as a purely nice thing. Um, and I've learned a lot from that, from the idea of, what happens when you sell something? Is it still sharing? Maybe not. You know, maybe not. Um, or maybe it depends. If, like so social customs, like make it okay, then it's okay. But if it's a new product, and the only way we had to make it is like forty dollars, then it's not sharing. It's like looks like a more like a maybe like a mer more of like a merchandise thing, which is like the last thing I wanted it to be. So it's, it, it was. Now I'm like I'm trying to think like what else. What new thing can we do? But it's a very difficult question to say, you know, we want to put out music in a very simple, accessible, and cheap way, but that makes more sense than a CD, and that it's not digital. It's like a lot of things to think about. But it's like a real question. I don't know why there isn't like a study and someone figures it out, because it's like a real thing, you know? It's like we need like a physical object to give someone, but it's not a vinyl, because that's like going to die at some point. Like, maybe, maybe not. I love them, not saying that, <laughs> just saying we need something else. We need something that like, you can just plug into. And that little object or something, piece of art. I, I find that the future of experiencing music is all about the shared experience. Right, right. And that it uh, comes down to the live experience. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know, I mean, if I can kind of instigate yeah, you on that tip. Um, when it comes to your what to, to your live performances and your live process, can you share a little bit about what you do live when you perform live? Right. Um, well, first of all, I think it's true that the live performance is a very real way to get music, and I and I and, and I and I like that. I like that because it works for the artists and it works for the audience. Right. Um, now, with electronic music, it makes it a little more difficult mm -hmm. to be as direct as you want to be. It's like a similar problem. It's because like if we are forced to use CDs, you know, um, and what I'm saying is there's a lot of happening in here, and I could be improvising a lot in here, but does that, you can't see any of it. You can't see anything that I'm doing. So to make that legible is very, very hard. And this is why I instantly took the easy way out, which was like, I've got to start playing with people, you know, and my band is right here, um, and, and, and I, in a way, they've just made me, re you know, they have made me, they have made me realize how to make it live, because I, I'm stuck in here, this is what I do, I don't, I'm, you know, I can play a little bit of piano, but I'm not that good at it, um, I really just like cutting, pasting things, um, but, uh, you know, having to share it with other people and try to create something with other people is what was most important to me at the beginning. And the one thing that we tr do try very hard to do is the improvisation thing. Um, we, we've, ne we've never had a, a recorded, a, a, a definite, definite playlist, or, or um, set list is what I mean to say. Um, we really try to say, okay, today for the first 20 minutes, we're going to build in C minor, 
and let's see where that takes us. And then we're going to drop into this song. That's like actually what we do. We just say 20 minutes of drone. And then we see where it takes us. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But I, I mean, maybe it's a naive part of me, but a part of me feels like that will, be, will feel more live than if we had something pre-recorded. Um, and I'm not going to say any names, but it's, 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 it's difficult for me to go see live music sometimes because of the amount of pre-recorded mm -hmm. um, things, whether it's pre-recorded vocals, pre-recorded you know, music, backing tracks. I mean, when you're a musician, you can see that, and it's obvious. It's staring you, yeah. at you in the face, and you realize that it's only a performance. And that's cool, I guess, in a way. But that's, pro that's also, I think, a little problematic. You know, um, and so I guess we try to improvise as much as possible mm -hmm. because you'll see, like maybe there'll be a wrong note, maybe there'll be something great that happens just because of the vibe of the crowd. I remember one time, uh, I think we were in Munich, and the crowd we just came in, we just came in, and the crowd started clapping at like like really fast, like 128 or something. And I've never, I mean, we play at 128 sometimes, but. You know, they were like, pa, 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 and we're like, this could be a rave. And I literally just like tapped the tempo on Ableton, put a clap on top of them, and we started our set at 128 and slowly build it back down. And I feel like, you know, they see them, to me it was like very simple. It was, they see themselves, they know they're clapping, and they know they were clapping before we got on stage at this, at this rate. And therefore, you know, how, how could it possibly not be live if we're playing to them, right? And that's what's most exciting for me. Um, and it'll be something like that that's more like concrete, mm -hmm. or it'll be something like, you know, we have a set planned and it's and it's for like a like a like a auditorium, right? And then we go to a festival the next day and it's like sunny, and and everyone's like drinking Coronas, right? We're like, oh, this is not gonna work. Right? And everyone's like wearing a tank top except for us, and we're bl wearing all black, and we're like, okay, we have to fix something here, right? And what we what we do there is like, okay, let's like make a super dancey set, and and start with percussion, and then Will's gonna play the saxophone all alone, and then I'm gonna come in with the piano, and then we see where we go from there. We have no idea, you know, we really don't know, and that's like precisely the point. Um, and but I still I still don't think it's enough. I still don't think it's enough. I'm, I'm still trying to find a way to, you know, even though I have like two synths and a microphone, I'm singing live, and, and I have a controller where I take the bass off and then drop it again and do other things. <laughs> you know, do other things, hopefully. If it's, a, if, a, if it's a good day, I do other things. No, of course I do other things. Um, and, you know, sequencing the drums and whatever. Um, it's, still, it's still not enough. And... and and I want it. To, I want to be to for playing the computer to be like playing a guitar. But it's not that yet. No, I mean, I would I would have to make that my whole job to like work on something. And I guess I prefer just making music all day, making beats, you know, than like trying to make a controller where like this does something, you know. Um. Yeah. I mean, I suppose that's what Morton Sabotnik did, right, when he helped develop the bukala. Right. That's because he wanted to do the music. Right. I have no idea what a book is. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> um, as no, it's one of the earliest synthesizers. Uh, maybe the second one that was created. And it, this was in, uh, Martin Zabonek did this talk on Community Festival last year, the same exact talk. Um, and he, he ha I think he was forced in a way to create a tool because it was. But we're beyond like fucked absolutely. in a way. Absolutely, this was the this was the late sixties. Yeah, it's it's even worse now, which right. is like if we were only playing synths, it would look pretty cool. It would be it look great, like oh look, it's a Moog, you know, that's that's great, <laughs> um, or like it, it's a drum machine, cool. Um, it's it's much worse than that now, you know. It's not like creating a synth that looks like you're doing something because synths are great. Yeah, they're doing something, you know, they're playing it, whatever. Now it's like you have one stupid software in there. That's bad, you know? It's like we need to fix it. We need to fix that, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we need to, we need to <laughs> yeah. fix this. <laughs> um, do you want to share any other music with yes. the room? why not? 
before maybe, and then maybe we go into some Q and A. Sure. Um, so let's see. Well, I want to make it relevant, and nothing there seems relevant. So why don't we just go to to quit? Actually, no. Let's play some juke because that that's always irrelevant. It's always pretty irrelevant. This is DJ Rashad. Juke interlude there. Um, DJ Rashad is great because I don't know why he's great, but I like that song. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, I, I just like that song, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Juke's taking over right now. Yeah. People love it. Yeah. I remember, so I, I wish this still happened, but I used to DJ every single Friday and sometimes every, you know, Saturday and play like three times in a row. People that went to high school, not high school, people that went to college with me know this. Um, and obviously, you know, I wanted to play, I guess in some form of elitist way, I wanted to play like the European dance music that was going on at the time. And then I realized that was like not working at all. No one wanted to hear that and everyone wanted to hear Rihanna, um, which, is, which is fine, which is totally fine. And I didn't want to play Rihanna because I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I like any of the, her songs, but nothing against her. Um, but I did want to play like Toxic by Britney Spears, which I think is an amazing song. It's pretty cheesy, but it's like, the production is pretty cool, right? And so I started making edits of that stuff. This was like three, four years ago. Um, and like, I guess two years ago, I, I like kind of started, you know, because of all these people trying to reference Duke, I was like, what is this, go what is this thing that's happening? And, and a DJ called Heidi, you know Heidi? Mm -hmm. Right, Heidi was playing a lot of Ghetto House, and I was like, this is amazing, and I really liked it. Um, and I started playing Duke and Ghetto House to these people that like, basically wanted to hear Rihanna, and they were all, all went crazy. It was this like, you know, it was as if you pitched up hip hop and like, gave it some crazy drugs, right? And, and that's why I like Duke, I guess. <laughs> Cause like, people, because I could DJ it for people that wanted something else, but it kind of fit right in the middle of, you know, like pretty good house music, you know. Turn that down a little bit to 120, 119, it'd be a pretty beautiful track. Um, but it was a little faster, and then it had that kind of ghetto thing, and with more hip hop. So I guess, I don't know, Juke seemed to hold a good place for. It's yeah. it was it's dirty enough for people right. who aren't used to listening to right. maybe like a different type of electronic music. Right. It's accessible for them, but right. it's also pushing the edge. It's pushing a little yeah. bit because it's like not a lot of people make music at 150 BPM. Right. I mean now more, but you know, yeah, yeah I like that. And also, I mean, the great thing about doing something with um, mixing Duke is that you can put. You know, the, the half time is a pretty obvious dubstep thing. You can play dubstep at whatever, 70 BPM or at 140. Um, but with Juke, you can do 160 and 80. So you can play hip hop with Juke, or you can play James Blake with Juke. And James Blake with Juke sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> That's like what was one of my favorite things to do, just play like him. I mean, I, could, I, I actually should play <laughs> Juke and James Blake. You guys probably would enjoy it. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to do it. Why not? I mean, see, look at that. From scratch, impro. You got the real thing. Where's my DJ set?
DJ set. It was a DJ set from Liberty Social. What was that? Melbourne. I also, I really liked the, the last, I mean, some of the songs in the last Nicki Minaj record, because they were also really crazy. It was just like insanity. Complete insanity. I don't know what she's thinking. <laughs> no, I mean, really. So, yeah, let's do this for a second. Why not? Where's, where's JB? Here. Oh, this, is, this is funny. Okay. So you all know this, this funny song. It's a great song. Let's put this a little louder. So I would sometimes play with Claire de Lune. Oh, no, 120, 120, 120, 120. It's nice, right? It's like a nice little piano. Um, and it's like, it can get pretty deep, I guess. <laughs> um, this is nice. I could listen to this for a while. And sometimes I would just like auto-filter James out. and then drop the juke, and that's where it gets interesting. <laughs> nice delay. Um, so, I'm not going to take a poll, but I would, of which juke song. Let me see you bounce, let me hit a doggy style, or where are them bust downs at? Let's do let me hit a doggy style, because that's the most hilarious one. <laughs> I love that. That was the juke James played. <laughs> this lecture DJ set idea should be should be just thought about a little bit, right? Like like Dixon or like Ricardo Villalobos should just sit down and be like, one day I put these two tracks together. <laughs> Could be a whole thing. Maybe this is a a whole new genre of DJ. And this is a good. Um, <laughs> maybe a good preview of what maybe what we might get on Sunday night. No, on Sunday night. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, if you guys, if if you guys want that, I would gladly play a DJ set. I thought it was booked for a live set, and and I was gonna I was gonna be a little more serious. But um, I mean, yeah, I could show you the goodies edit, and I could show you many things that are very funny. Um, but but that I also that I also personally love because I I mean I was I you know grew up I was 13 in 2003 like. The Neptunes were doing like incredible work. At least I think it, it's really amazing. And Dr. Dre was amazing in 2001, 2000. Snoop Dogg, you know. So all this stuff for me is like totally ingrained. I can't do anything about it. I think it's amazing no matter what. Um, and 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 I guess I really miss DJing at Brown because I could do funny things or things that weren't like cool or anything and didn't really matter. You know. I feel like if I go to Fabric and and play that, I mean, it, you know, it'd be kind of, I don't know, I don't know what it would be, but it would be weird, <laughs> you know? I have a feeling that people here might react strongly in a positive way if you play that cool. on That's Sunday cool. night. That's cool. I mean, I always love any occasion I can play Duke. I'm, you know, we're going to Mamaya and where is it? Where's Mamaya? In Romania, just to play Duke. So. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, the story with that is that we got billed with people that play very fast. And Dave and I, Dave is a Mr. Darkside, who we, we do Darkside together. And we were like, oh, you know, we'll just go over there and play Juke and it'll be fine. So sometimes it, it does positive things. Um, maybe we should open it up for questions. And sure. is, there a, is there any more water available by chance? I wouldn't mind some water. Um, I mean, no, that didn't sound like a, it sounded a little harsh. <laughs> It's totally fine if there's no water. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, can, uh, I can hand the mic around the room. I'm happy to do that for people who want to ask questions. Hi. Hi, my name is Yannick. I'm here with my wife. Uh, all the Hello, way from Yannick. France. She's from Portland. Nice. Been following you for a long time. And you were saying um, that you're looking into like developing or improving or changing from using Ableton. Right. Um, I know. I, I'm sure you know him. His name is Ripperton. He's this uh, sw uh, Swiss, I think, DJ, who, for example, is using a knife and like this old phone to to do vocals. I think that's the frivolous. All right. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Frivolous. Yeah. Well, I know. I, I don't know. Have you ever <laughs> thought about using um, these kinds of yeah. instruments? Yeah. I wanted to be, and when I saw frivolous for the first time, was here, in Communiki. I think it's awesome what he does. I personally would want it to be more musical than that. Um, just because the, um, it's not, not that it's a gimmick, but it's, it's, it just does one thing, or a couple of things. Um, and I think what I was talking about when there need, this needs to get fixed is the fact that I was just moving around things and I was putting Claire de Lune in and out and all these things and putting a clap that you guys didn't even know I put, right? Um, I wish that could be visual. You could see, like, oh, he's about to put a clap in. That'd be cool. But that, you know, it wasn't like there was a screen here that was like, Nico's about to put a clap in, you know, that it was like a real visual thing. How do we do that? I don't know. I just saw Purity Ring play in L.A. and, you know, they're doing this cute light thing. It's cool. I, like, I think it's great, but it's... It's still like, I, I don't know, I want, it's, um, I don't know how to explain it. I guess it's easy to do something that can fit inside of this world, right? And so you hit a knife with a resonator or whatever, great. Um, but for this to actually be translated and to be turned into an instrument is, I guess, the really difficult thing. We were just talking today about this thing that we did as a band um, two years ago, and then I got bored of it. Um, which was, I had a contact mic, and we would, um, we would, we would ask for a different object every night. And so, once we got an owl, like a plastic owl, and so we put a spotlight on the owl, and the contact mic on, on the owl's back, and I would just smack the owl, and it would make a nice sound. It was great for like that night we played in Amsterdam like two years ago, but it still felt to me like a, like a cute little gimmick, and not like something that is sustainable. You know, it's not like I want to be smashing owls the rest of my life or smashing anything really. I want to like be able to do what I do with the mouse, you know, and for people to know what I do. It's it's hard, yeah. yeah. But I agree that. People are trying to do things that are like instruments in themselves. And that's a, that's a way, that's like a step forward for sure. When I saw Frivolous, I was blown away. Totally. I was totally blown away. I thought it was so cool. Um, I do think the problem is, might be, might be get, getting even more and more difficult because of the fact that everything is more and more inside the box. You know? So uh, I have a question. Like, uh, so are you like doing this more into uh, using the, the Alberton Life? You know, kind of that tool when you are doing the performing. So uh, you know, like there are a lot of DJs that does that. I mean, Skirax they use a lot of controllers to you know right. play the samples. So what uh, kind of character do you think you 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 have to make you distinguish from other DJs and you know none people from none. That's the problem. Me. Yeah, or, I, or in I, general, what do we uh, have? 
you like 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 either musically like if you have some certain tones or, or the sample that you select right. or some mu uh, right. rhythm pack patterns like right you yeah no yeah I, I get I get the question what what makes it different um, since we all have access to the same controllers this is the problem nothing makes it different um, sure I'm there I'm singing I'm playing the keyboard myself and and I have a way of working with Ableton that I think is unique because we all have our own unique ways of working with our software. Um, and I've patched the computer into a controller in a, in, a, in a way that makes sense for me. And then not a lot of, not, I don't think a lot of people would do it. And, I mean, I, I actually, actually kind of um, made a, a step sequencer for my controller. So that's like kind of different in a way. It's not just like, like I can like, make all the drum programming. And it's not like the machine where you like have to press 10 buttons to get that. It's just like it's all laid down there. It's great. Um, but no, what I, 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 think, I think you're right. It's, it's, it's difficult to distinguish um, because we all have access to the same machines. And as I was telling Kate before, I haven't like, you know, wasted two months of my life to try to make a custom-made controller which would be, I think, the next step. I just, I haven't had time, and, and I also, whenever I do have time, I try to make music instead of worrying about that. Um, but I do think the next step is artists making their own controllers. That seems like a pretty obvious new thing. Um, and you know, the marketing cap uh, capacity of that is incredible. It's like, you know, I was, I made a joke a year ago that like Skrillex would have a gun, you know, like a nice, you know, thing or like, like a pretty violent looking, you know, um, like controller or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like it would fit everyone, everyone's music. Um, but maybe not. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just think, um, there's, there's, uh, the, the customizable element of, of it is, is probably what the, where the future is. Hi, my name is Jakob. Um, I actually have a question, comment, suggestion maybe. Uh, MIT, um, they had a student team that just developed uh, mat, or, uh, music gloves. And uh, Imogen or Imogen Heap is using them now. And you can do anything with them, mm. whether it be raise the bass, treble, anything, just by raising your hand or, right. you know, anything. Right. And uh, maybe getting in contact with with them right. in some in some way. I think you could do wonders with right. it. Well, here's the interesting thing about this: there's countless of of really um, exciting things that you can do with, you know, putting cables all over your body and and whatever. Um, but it's about what fits to your music, right? And so for Imogen Heap, that sounds perfect, you know? Right, well, she could also just like, you know, go like this and filter her voice in and out, and that sounds very, if I, I promise you, if I went up on stage and just like did this, it would look, <laughs> would look pretty strange, you know? Um, and that's the problem, is that, you know, <laughs> what, what do I do instead of, you know, I'm not, sadly, I'm not Imogen Heap. <laughs> I wish I could, no, but here's the thing. <laughs> You know, right, but I wish I could, like, do that, you know. <laughs> Other questions? Hi. Hello? Okay. Um, so it seems that you're making a lot of music, and you commented that you made a song yesterday. Yes. And played it for us. Um, I feel like a lot of your music isn't quite as accessible to the public as I would hope it could be. Right. Um, and I was just wondering if you have any intention to maybe, I don't, you know, like maybe release more or like, um, like kind of drop daily tracks or, you know, just to where we could like find in an easier accessibility your, your music and what you're working with on a daily basis. Right. That's interesting. I've, I've, um, hmm. So here's what's difficult. Um, 
the, the big question is always about, do you keep a song for a larger format of a release? So for your next album, right? Or do you give it out to people for free? Or do you put it in, in an EP or whatever, right? I, I don't know whether a song is really good or good until three, four months after I make it. And I would only, always feel it premature to give a song right away because it could be a very good song that I should keep and release in a more serious way, right? Or it could, or it could be a song that, um, that is fine to just give away. So it's, it's difficult to know that. That's the first problem. But I do agree that, um, and, and what we're kind of working on does have something to do with releasing something every week. And it'll start soon. It'll start soon. Um, because I do think there's something, if, it's, if things are going to be digital, right, then they should at least have something human to them. <laughs> and the idea of a ritual is nice and, and pretty human. The idea of something coming back every, every week. And so that's kind of something we're working on. Um, and finally, you know, the truth of the matter is that... Um, I, like really 99% of the stuff I make is really stupid and, and, and not that good. And so, you know, the stuff that I do release, I think I'm proud of it, right? Or there's like a one-year one time window to where, when I'm proud of it, and then I get a little not so proud of it. But, um, and so I can't really just release everything I make because it wouldn't be that good. That's just a reality of it. You know, you can't, sadly, you can't make good music every day. I wish I could. Trust me, if I could make a good song every day, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know what I would do. Yeah. Thank you, Kate, for doing the walking around. Hey, um, so if you miss playing music at house parties or whatnot at Brown and getting to do the Druke and the James Blake mix thing, um, <laughs> I'd like to offer you an invitation to come play a house party tonight in Boulder and play all the juke you want. Could be Thank a fun you. time. Thank you. Are there other questions? Hi. So you're 23. Yes. When you are 50, what is it going to be about? And is, do you find it, and that's a very vague, broad question, but you're very young, and it's, that's inspiring. So in the past year, you've already accelerated to this point. When you're 50, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> mm. That's interesting. The only thing that got recorded was, what do you think? <laughs> um, so I could answer anything, and no one would know what you asked. No, but I will answer your question. Um, so, it's a pretty deep question. Maybe we need a soundtrack to it. <laughs> no, that'll make it a little weird. Um, the, um, so, it, it's changed for me a lot. At the, be at the very, very beginning, I was making music because I enjoyed making music, and I was trying to give it to people because... I guess it feels nice to make to feel like people are listening to what you do. It's like that simple, I promise you. When you're 15, I mean, I, I, when I was 15, that's all I was thinking about. Um, I was lucky that uh, Wolf and Lamb picked me up, and I and I just started releasing it in a wider, to wider, a slightly wider community of people. This is how Kate and I met when I was when after I played my first show, actually. Um, but now it's changed a lot, and, and it makes it, and, and this whole career thing makes it very strange. It's been now uh, almost a year that I'm out of school, so doing this for a living, and my motivations have, have changed a lot. Um, it's not that simple anymore to, to just think, oh, I'm going to just make music, and that's my life. It's not that simple, right? Because the, the actual thing of making music every day is, at least for me, honestly, it's, it's just staring at you, failing, failing to do this, failing to do that, failing to do 
you know, what you're trying to actually achieve. And that's the nature of it, because if you actually achieved everything you tried to do, then I think songs would, wouldn't really be that interesting, or maybe they, they wouldn't even come out, right? Um, so what am I going to do when I'm 50? I have no idea. Um, I hope I still, I, I think, the only thing that I hope and that I, and that I think is the most sacred thing is to want to be really honest with like what you're trying to tell people and this is another thing about not releasing music every day um which i could you're totally right i could like release like a hip-hop beat if i don't have a song but i could release something um it's that i not everything comes out of me not, not everything that comes out of me that i make is honest it's not like maybe one day like i I go to a show and I'm like, oh, these people, like, they're, what they're doing is so cool. And then I try to make a song like that. And I'm like, I'm such an idiot. Why am I trying to make, like, lo-fi punk rock? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. no reason to do that. It's not me. <coughs> Nothing about that. You know, I don't know anything about it. Um, and so, for me, it's, it's important to, ha like, finish a song, have it sit there, and then reevaluate it and think, does this really you know, say, at its, is it the most accurate portrayal of what I was living at that moment in time? And if it is, then it means that we're all human beings, we all have the same, similar feelings, you know, some people might connect. And, and, and one thing that I, that I was, that, that, that made me think of is that both your questions together, kind of mixing them, um, maybe that what made me think of is, I, I try to make very accessible music. I, I really do. I, I don't try to make difficult music at all. I don't. I, I have no reason to. Um, because the point is to communicate an idea. The point is not to like, I mean, I don't even know what difficult music would, does. I don't, I don't know what it does, apart from please some critics. Um, the, the most important thing for me is to be accessible. And I think if music isn't as accessible as other music, it doesn't mean that it's actually less accessible. It just means that we're used to something that might be, maybe, that just might not be right, you know? Um, I do think, like, what plays in the radio is just a little hardcore. It's, like, it's a little excessive, you know? Um, so I don't think that by making music that is not as excessive as that, um, it's, less ex it's less accessible, right? Um, let's take, I will go there, uh, let's take the last, the, the, the first Daft Punk song that was released, right? Huge hit, everyone loves it, whatever. Um, I do think it's a lazy song. I think it's, if you actually hear the, the, um, um, and if anyone wants to quote that, please don't, because there's no reason I should be saying bad things about Daft Punk. But, um, but no, but just to, 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 to actually get to this, I just think it's a lazy song, right? And the fact that it's such a successful song says a lot about, um, about, you know, what what we are all used to. It's catchy for me too. I I, I think it's you know, I think it's great too. Um, but there's, if you look at the simplicity of it and how it's like, six, you know, sixteen bar loop, uh, a verse, a chorus, another, Pharrell sings again, and then he does the thing again and the vocoders come in and then there's like a really bad solo actually it's a pretty bad solo um and then it's over you know it's like it's it's actually strange to me that that's what you know the epitome of an amazing song is nowadays um nothing against daft punk i think what they've done is amazing and they've helped me and and everyone who is makes electronic music i just think it's a it's a good example of the type of music that can be very very well received and very well liked, but that is still slightly lazy. And I think that's a little, it's, it's, I think we've gotten used to something that is like that, that is very easily marketable. Um, but I don't think less easily marketable music is, is, is less accessible, actually. But I might change my mind tomorrow. <laughs> I have, no, really, I don't know. I, I have no idea. Sorry, I, sometimes I say things as if I really mean them, but, right? I mean, maybe, maybe I've done that for the past hour. I really don't know. I have no idea. 
Like in, literally tomorrow, maybe, I, I will think it's a genius, um, genius structure for a song. <laughs> but maybe I won't. But maybe I will. Um, are there further questions? Daft Punk lovers? Um, when you're sampling from the uh, the records, some some of the music you know, some you don't. I I, I wondered um, since any of the records could could be um, uh, using acoustic uh, instruments, they they might be traditional jazz or rock. Um, do you ever go into a studio or or put friends together with acoustic instruments to to create? something well for, from from scratch do, do you do you write for musicians or ask different musicians you know you want trombone or or just whatever some some acoustic sound um yeah well dave and i have a record coming out dave with the very nice blonde hair here in the front um dave and i have a record coming out very soon that is just him and i in the studio playing playing instruments very different than the rest of my music that I sample a lot and, and do things more inside the computer. This is very much, you know, Dave and I, you know, just singing lines back to each other. And, you know, there's some guitar lines, or at least now he just told me a couple of days ago, one guitar line where I just sang to him. I sang this thing and he played it in guitar. But then there's many things that, you know, I wrote here that he told me to do and and yes, I think that's one of the most exciting things that you can do, um, because what you can what you can do with a computer, you know, obviously is is pretty endless. And what the instruments do is that they completely limit you. And that combination is amazing, you know, like a guitar sound. Yeah, you can change it a lot, a lot, a lot. But you're still going to be working with this fa almost found footage. You know, it's like this three minute thing that Dave did, for example, that then we have to work on making into a song. It's exciting. It's like, it's similar to this. It's like sampling him. I, I really enjoy that way of working, yeah. And that's what basically the, the next record sounds like. Um, so I was thinking more about uh, the dilemma of performing live and wanting to be able to show you know, like, what are you doing? Or I'm putting in a clap here rather than have people not pick up on that or whatever. Right. Um, so I was kind of wondering, you know, why don't you just stream your screen? Um, and then I kept thinking I more about one. that. You did? Yeah. Uh, How to go over? Um, well, I did it in a similar thing to this, right? Where I improvised for an hour. And people, and it was just, I guess, a bunch of, like, able to nerds. <laughs> And like, I just improvised for an hour, and they saw the things that I did, and then they asked me questions about it. It was like a more nerdy thing. Um, the idea of like a club where like you're there with your honeys, and then there's like a nice computer screen, <laughs> you know, maybe is 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 still not there. I'm just, I guess, you know, what's funny about this is that most of the things you can actually do, like what you just said, like stream your the screen, end up just looking funny. Which is great. Like, if I was like a comedy techno act, it would probably work, you know? So, so the, the second part to my question, I, I kind of thought about that too, it, that maybe DJs or performers aren't doing that because there, there's this fear that, you know, like what I'm doing is actually much simpler than it's coming off. And like, I don't want to reveal that all I'm really doing is and putting a clap on two and four and pressing the clip to play. Right. Well, there are some people that do that. There's some people that do more. So, and that's, that's, that's the other problem. That, for me, that's another problem for me. Like, we try to, you know, I just told you, we're like, I, I, you know, I try to go out of my way to show people that I'm playing live, right? But then at the same time, it could all be recorded. It could have just been a coincidence that the claps of the crowd and... My 128 BPM cra um, claps were were in sync, right? It's yeah, it's a, it's a problem. The screen thing is interesting, I think, for outside of a club, and and it, in its own kind of like the time that I improvise and and like 
people there could really see what I was doing, and even people that weren't uh, familiar with the program understood kind of a couple of things, how they were, you know, what was being looped, what was being stacked. That was cool. But it's not so much of um, I guess it's, it's, it's difficult to have that be a party, right? And it's difficult for, to have that be laced with the kind of mysterious virtuosity of like Jimi Hendrix playing a guitar, which is like the most beautiful thing, right? It's not, that, it's not the same, sadly. It's not like, yeah, I mean, I, I move my mouse pretty fast. It's true. <laughs> like, I'm pretty good with my mouse, but like, it's like a pretty sad thing to be good at. So is is there this like mysticism or this like wonderful aspect about performing live where you you don't quite know how how something's being done or uh, as a as a musician myself I um I really enjoy when I'm trying to figure out how they're doing something or that they've stumped me in some way or I don't know And that's yeah and that's the I guess one of the things that I like the most about about an electronic music performance is like you're there and you're seeing this guy do something and like the lights are really dark and the music is pretty dark itself and mysterious and and it gets you thinking right it gets you imagining what this is about what the guy must be thinking what the guy's actually doing and you're thinking maybe you're thinking about low pass filters and like noise pedals and like the other person is thinking about like oh is that a guitar sound right um that's cool but and, and it saved a lot of people, right? I mean, because if everyone found it boring to be, to be just looking at someone doing not much, then we would have a problem. Um, I do think that having an actual live show with lights and visuals is, a, is, is, a, is an easy way of, of getting out of that problem. Um, and so... At least for now, I think the, the idea of collaborating with musicians is, is as live as it can get if you're working with a computer. Are there other questions? Uh, so to pig, piggyback on that one, um, you keep coming back to that example of um, you know clapping with the crowd. And so do you think that sort of involving the crowd in subtle ways has potential to also you know, maybe the crowd isn't sure, and that's sort of the best part about it. They're not sure whether you're doing it intentionally or if it's um, just a co happy coincidence, you know? I think. Right. Do you think there's potential there? I think there's potential there, but it also depends on the, um, on the place. Um, if it's like a big auditorium and you're far away from the crowd, then you could only maybe record the sounds of people talking, which is probably the most annoying sound for a musician in the world. Um, and maybe you could do something cool with that, but um, I remember I played at Bar 25 a month before, Bar 25 in Berlin, a month before it, um, it closed, and this is a pretty psychedelic place, to say the least, um, and in the middle of my set, someone opened a sunroof that suddenly appeared on, on top of me, and a very, very hairy man um, <laughs> came down from it, and he was, I, I, I swear to God, and he was... Um, <laughs> And he was backwards, right? So his face was right here. Um, and what I did is, is I, I had my... Back then, I actually would have my microphone go inside my computer because I would auto-tune myself um, slightly because I, I didn't really know how to sing that well. I still don't, but I can kind of fake it more now. I can, like, try to do it. Before I used auto-tune, whatever. It was going into my computer. And I gave him the microphone, and I looped him. Right? And everyone, and, and it was like a pretty small place. It was like 200 people, bar 25, everyone could see it. And, and people saw that, right? And that was cool. And like, people remembered that. And that was nice. It was a very psychedelic, hairy man singing. Um, and so, but you know, the sad thing, not sad, this is not sad, but I, I, we have been playing for more and more people, and therefore, it's not a sad thing, it's a good thing. But you do lose that ability to be in like a kind of nice environment where peop with people where you feel like you can do that type of thing and where there's people coming out of the ceiling, you know? That I, I have kind of stopped doing, playing at places like that, but now we're starting again because I realize that it's, you need that. I mean, I need that personally if I don't do that.
think we're at time, so I'm going to stop the questions. Great. Um, but I want to say real quick that there are only a handful of tickets left for Sunday night's Clown and Sunset Label Showcase. So if you're planning to attend, you should purchase them now. Um, and From Scratch is sold out for tomorrow. Um, and now I'm just going to go ahead and mention the show that's happening. Uh, Masaki Bato is here from Japan. Um, he is performing his Brain Pulse music experiment show in the black box downstairs after this there's a show at 7.45 that's for university folks, and there's a show at 9 o'clock for pass holders. Um, so if you do not have a pass and you want to attend the Brain Pulse music performance, um, please go to the 7.45 showing, and the other one's at 9, and that's just downstairs um, in this building. And there's four vinyl for anyone who wants it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Serious, go take it if you guys want it. <laughs>